Welcome back. We are studying the Sabbath School lessons on the Psalms. If you've joined us in our previous studies, you recognize that there's a central theme through the Psalms, and that theme is the honest, open-hearted prayers of the psalmists seeking God with, when there's evil and suffering all around them. The Psalms do not deny the reality of human suffering, but the Psalms present a God who's there in human suffering, a God who's always present with his people, and a God that will one day bring suffering to the end. In our lesson today, it's entitled, I Will Arise. The theme text comes from Psalm 12 and verse 5. Let's take a look at that psalm. Psalm 12, verse 5, says this, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, ah, now I will arise, says the Lord. Notice God says, I'm going to arise. The poor are being oppressed. The needy are sighing, sighing and crying out. But God says, I'm going to arise. I will be their defender. I will be their protector. Now, in ancient Jewish culture, the thought was that poverty was a sign of God's displeasure and riches were a sign of God's favor. And what the psalmist is saying is, that poverty is not a sign of God's displeasure at all. People may be poor because of the circumstances of their life. They may be poor because of the environment that they were brought up in. They may be poor because of the, of the context in which they've had to try to flourish. So poverty is not a sign of God's displeasure at all. In fact, God takes special concern he has special care for the poor. And here in this lesson, it says, uh, second to last paragraph under the Sabbath afternoon's lesson, only the creator whose throne is founded on righteousness and justice can provide with his sovereign judgment, stability and prosperity to the world. The twofold aspect of divine judgment includes deliverance of the oppressed and destruction of the wicked. So what this lesson is all about is this. God's concern or care for the poor, our, as Christians, care for the poor, helping to meet their needs, and the reality of the fact that because God is righteous, one day he will deliver the poor, the needy, one day they'll live in a land where there is no more want, no more suffering, no more heartache or death. And one day the wicked who've oppressed the poor, one day they will be destroyed. So Sunday's lesson is entitled The Majestic Warrior. Psalm 18 verse 3 says, I'll call upon the Lord. Verse 18 says, the Lord is my support. Psalm 76 verse 9 says, God arose in judgment to deliver the oppressed. Uh, Psalm 144, 5 to 7 says, Rescue me, deliver me, O God. These Psalms, according to the first paragraph in our lesson, praise the Lord for his awesome power over the evil forces that threaten his people. They portray God in his majesty as warrior and judge. Now, the image of God as warrior is frequent in the Psalms. It highlights the severity and urgency of God's response to his people's cries and suffering. So this idea, God is, is warrior. He comes to make war on evil. He comes to defend his people. He comes as the mighty leader who will bring to his people encouragement and hope, who will destroy the powers of wickedness. And there are very fascinating very fascinating allusions to God. In Psalm 18, for example, verse 13 to 15, look at some of those allusions to God. Let's look at verse 13. They're quite interesting. The Lord thundered in the heavens. You know, you think of this rolling thunder. The Lord thunders in the heavens. And the Most High uttered his voice. Hailstones, coals of fire, 
He sent his arrows, scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance. He vanished, vanquished them. Then the channels of waters were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of your nostrils. You notice all the different allusions to God's power there. Thunder, hailstone, coals of fire, lightning, channels of water. Gods are called God's rebuke. In other words, he is the mighty warrior. And although evil may prevail, it reminds me of James Russell Lowell's poem, Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown stands God, keeping watch above his own. Evil may not always be judged quickly, and it won't be, but it will be judged. God's people may not always see apparent deliverance, but they will be delivered by his grace and through his power. Down here, third paragraph down, about the third sentence down in the paragraph, in his many battles against the enemies of God's people, King David praised God as the only one who achieved all the victories. It would have been easy for David to take credit for what happened, for his many successes and triumphs, but that was not his frame of mind. He knew where the source of his power came from. In the battle against evil, in the battle against wickedness, it's not our strength but it's God's strength. It's not our ability to triumph over evil. It's God's ability to triumph through us over evil. For he, as Sunday's lesson is entitled, is the majestic warrior. Now one day, Monday's lesson, there'll be justice for the oppressed. If you've looked up every one of those texts, there are five texts that are, six texts actually, that are given in our lesson. In Psalm 9, verse 18, the needy are not forgotten. In Psalm 12, verse 5, God rises up to support the needy. In Psalm 40, God again uh, triumphs over the powers of hell. And David says, I'm poor and needy, but it's God who's my deliverer. In Psalm 113, 7, uh, David prays, raise the poor out of dust. Psalm 146. Now, I want to look at Psalm 146 with you. And so if you happen to be following along in your Bible, turn to Psalm 146. And we want to take a look at that particular psalm that talks about God's power and God's deliverance. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, praise the Lord. I'll sing praises to God while I have my being. Don't put your trust in princes nor in the son of man where there's no health. Why not? His spirit or his breath departs. He returns to the earth. In other words, he's going to die. Where's my hope? Happy, verse 5, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice. The Lord opened, verse 8, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who bowed before him. The Lord loves righteousness. He watches over the strangers. What does he do? Strangers. He, the, he watches over them. He relieves the fatherless and the widow, but the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. So here, in these Psalms, in, in Monday's lesson, it talks about that God is going to reign justice for the oppressed. The expression poor and needy is not limited, second paragraph of Monday's lesson, to material poverty, but signifies vulnerability, helplessness. The expression appeals to God's compassion. It conveys the idea that the sufferer is alone and has no other help but God. The depiction poor and needy also pertains to one's sincerity, truthfulness, and love for God in confessing one's total dependence on God and renouncing any trace of self-reliance and self-assertion. So all of us, in a sense, are poor and needy. We're poverty-stricken for righteousness. We are needy for the strength of God. And here, in this psalm, God promises to be with the poor and the needy. The poor and needy who are physically poor and need, in need of material things. 
but those of us who are spiritually poverty-stricken. In Tuesday's lesson, the title becomes, How Long Will You Judge Unjustly? Psalm 82 it was, it's a very interesting psalm. When I first read it, it was difficult for me to understand, honestly. I had to pour over it a number of times, pray over it, to understand it. Look, in Psalm 82, verse 1, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long would judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and the needy free from the hand of the wicked. Now, the part that confused me is he judges among the gods. What is that talking about? When you understand that the Bible talks at times about the leaders being in the place of God, and what this is talking about is that here you have leadership that is assumed the role of God, but God is the only rightful ruler of the universe. He is the sovereign one, who reigns from his throne in the sanctuary, and these so-called quote-unquote gods are false gods, false leaders, and they'll be judged. The lesson points this out very nicely, I think, second to last paragraph, Tuesday's lesson. Psalm 82 mockingly exposes the apostasy of some leaders who believe themselves to be gods above other people. See, so when it says he judges among the gods, these leaders are... They believe themselves that they're higher than the people, that they're like the gods. Although God gave the authority and privilege to the Israel leaders to be called the children of the Most High and to represent them, God renounces the wicked leaders. God reminds them that they're mortal, subject to the same moral laws as all people. No one is above God's law. God will judge the entire world. So here in Psalm 82, in... Uh, Tuesday's lesson, it points out that leaders who think that they have the authority of God and who treat people unjustly and who oppress the poor, they will be judged by God. He will pour out, Wednesday's lesson, his indignation. Psalm 58, 6 to 8, Psalm 69 particularly. Let's look at Psalm 69, verses 22 to 28. Psalm 69, verses 22 to 28. And here's this, what the scripture says. Let their table become a snare before them. That's a table of the wicked, those that oppress the poor. And their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and make their loins shake continually. <laughs> Pour out your indignation upon them. Let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let, your habitation be, let their habitation be desolate. Let no one dwell in their tents. Verse 28, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. So here, Wednesday's lesson talks about David's prayer that the wicked one day be ultimately destroyed. God has reached out to them. God has sought them. God has sent his Holy Spirit to their heart. God has brought conviction to them, but they've rebelled. They've turned their back on God, and they've oppressed the poor. Um, second paragraph down in Wednesday's lesson. Yet the psalmist's indignation in the face of oppression is a good one. It means that the psalmist took right and wrong more seriously than did many people. He cares even greatly about the evil that's done in the world, not just to himself, but to others also. Last paragraph, last couple of sentences. Wednesday's lesson. Divine judgment obliges God's people to raise their voices against all evil and seek the coming of God's kingdom in its fullness. The Psalms also give voice to those who suffer, letting them know that God is aware of their suffering and one day justice will come. So this lesson, this week, talks about really two or three things that I think that are vital truths. One, as Christians, we have responsibility to minister to those around us who are poor. They can be poor and needy spiritually, and we can minister to them. They can be poor and needy from a material standpoint, and we can minister to them. So they can be poor and needy in a variety of ways. So the first lesson, I think, from this week's study is have a compassionate, sensitive heart to the people around you 
that are poor and needy. The second lesson is that God is a mighty warrior and he will judge the wicked who oppress the poor and needy and eventually they'll be blotted out of his book and eventually destroyed forever. The third lesson is that God is with the poor and needy to encourage them and to strengthen them. And that leads us to Thursday's lesson, the Lord's judgment in the sanctuary. Psalm 96, God judges earth from his sanctuary. Psalm 99, God reigns between the cherubims. Psalm 132, the Lord has chosen Zion as his habitation. I do want to look at Psalm 132. Psalm 132, verse 7 to verse 9. We'll take a look at that. It talks about God's judgment from his sanctuary. Psalm 132, verse 7. Let us go to his tabernacle. Let us go to his tabernacle. David says, look, there's a lot going on in the world. I'm being, David says, I'm being pursued by Saul and his forces. Uh, death seems to be inevitable for me. I'm poverty stricken. I, I have a, a rock for my pillow as I sleep out under the stars. My body at times is racked with pain. But David says, let's go to his, his sanctuary. Let's worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you in the ark of your strength. Yet your priests be clothed with righteousness. Your saints shout for joy for, you, for your servant David's sake. And do not turn your face from the anointed. And then he comes down here and he says, The Lord has chosen Zion, verse 13. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I'll satisfy her poor with bread. David says, by faith. David says, by faith. By faith, I will rest in the sanctuary. By faith, I will dwell in the pavilion of God. By faith, my heart will rest in the joy of his grace in the tabernacle above. David says, I will not allow the things around me to discourage me. Second paragraph, Thursday's lesson. At the sanctuary, the plan of salvation was revealed. That's revealed to David. In paganism, sin was revealed and understood primarily as a physical stain to be eliminated by magic rites. In contrast, the Bible presents sin as a violation of God's moral law. God's holiness means that he loves justice and righteousness. Likewise, God's people should pursue justice and righteousness and should worship in his holiness. To, that, they must, to do that, they must keep God's law. In other words, as we're changed by grace and transformed by his love, as we're led to obedience to his law, we have a compassion for the poor. We have a love for those that are needy. We have a concern for those who are less fortunate than we are. But one day, we know that the God who forgives, that God will come again. He will defeat all evil. Righteousness will reign forever and ever and ever. Friday's lesson, the Psalms oblige people to raise their voices against evil and to seek the coming of God's kingdom in its fullness. In the Psalms, we're given the assurance of divine comfort and deliverance. The Lord will arise. The Lord will arise. When you feel somewhat discouraged or downhearted, know that the Lord will arise. When sickness ravages your body and you feel weak and fainting, almost near death, know the Lord will arise. When you look out over the world and see the suffering and the heartache and the sorrow and the disappointment, know that the Lord will arise. He will arise to strengthen you. He will arise to encourage you. He will arise to give you hope. He will arise in judgment to come again, destroy evil, and restore all of his people to the divine glory that they had before sin so that they can reign with him and live with him forever and ever and ever. Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, we thank you for the encouraging ministry of the Psalms. We thank you if for the solutions to this divine mystery that there will be evil and wickedness. But the ultimate solution is to see you in the sanctuary, to know your presence, to sense that you're with us, that you'll never leave us or forsake us. We thank you and praise you for everything that you have done for us and everything you will do. In Christ's name, amen.